Hello and welcome back to ThoughtBat. In today's video, I'm going to be discussing the application of law in a potential anarchist society. Of course, it's become a bit of a cliche for anarchist channels to spell out that anarchism is not about lawlessness or chaos, but, on the contrary, establishing a spontaneous order amongst individuals via voluntary association. While of course they're correct for the most part, though I can think of some strains of anarchism which have no concern for anarchist law whatsoever, illegalists perhaps being the most obvious example, Anarchist videos going into detail on how stateless law could work are actually quite uncommon, though like this one, some do exist. One of the most common allegations against anarchism is that we have no proposal for maintaining universal rights within a society, and that we are utopian in that we believe the establishment of an anarchist society will somehow eradicate violent crime altogether via mere disincentivization. The most notable recent example of this came from Vorsch, who until now I've managed to keep away from my scripts, but it provides us a good example of an influential political figure misunderstanding the anarchist argument. Some people are just pieces of shit. I feel like a lot of lefties, like, fail in the application of their theory because they fail to account for the some people are pieces of shit, like... This is how I feel about anarchists and prison abolition. Well, what about the people who are pieces of shit? And they're like, well, in an anarchist society, with proper reformative justice, nobody would be piece of shit. And I'm like, well, some people would still be pieces of shit. Maybe fewer would be, but some would be, you know. So what do we do about that, you know? I don't know. I've just, I've never heard answers to these questions that really convince me. It feels like the best that we can do is dismantle the state and maintain some basic governmental apparatuses that still have ways of, like, correcting bad social behavior. I could challenge Vorsch to name one person who thinks nobody would be a piece of shit, but that's beside the point. When it comes to addressing violent crime, it is true that anarchists do indeed talk about reducing or mitigating the social economic pressures which incentivize people to commit violent crime as an alternative to excessive police spending, but not as a substitute for communal security altogether. We are fully aware that violent individuals will still exist in an anarchist society and may well need to be detained by some means or another. With regard to prison abolition, prisons are defined as institutions which legally hold people as punishment for crimes they have committed. Anarchists are opposed to punishment, i.e. a penalty imposed as a means of retribution, and so are opposed to the usage of prisons as a means of addressing violent crime. However, we do acknowledge detainment units and rehabilitation centres play a necessary role for keeping others safe from particularly violent individuals. Another common allegation against anarchists is that we as a movement are often incoherent or vague in our proposals. For anarchists, there is a very obvious answer to this remark. The political philosophy of anarchism has many varying strains, which is unsurprising given that we are advocating a free society which celebrates experimental association and organisation. The diversity of thought in the anarchist camp is mistaken for incoherency and our acknowledgement for multiple forms of praxis and organisation is dismissed for vagueness. Another reason for our diversity in thought and practice is due to the materialistic nature of Western anarchism. As Fredon noted and Bakunin concurred, an idea is like a flower rooted in the soil of material conditions. It thus follows that different soils, embedded with different seeds, produce different flowers, and so we have a diverse garden of ideas being put into place, some adapted to the environment and some less so. But that doesn't mean that there exists no rigid models for dealing with issues such as law which have been put forward by anarchists. The capacity to defend oneself and possessions are a necessary component of living a free and happy life. So the question I'm going to answer today is, how can this be done? In this video, I'm going to discuss the nature of law and challenge common conceptions about law and order. Then, I'll explore a variety of models put into practice in several anarchist experiments to paint a clear picture of how legal order may be maintained in anarchist societies. Next, I will discuss the emerging theory of polycentric legal order from the 20th century, which I argue can be found in proto-form in aforementioned anarchist experiments from history. Without further ado, let's begin. So first off, what is law? Put very simply, law requires two things. The endorsement of a social norm by people within a community, for example, affording and respecting another person's moral right to life. And secondly, a means of enforcing the law if it is violated, for example, detaining a murderer. So we can already think of a few examples of how laws could function in very small communities. Let me provide an example. 
a primitivist commune of about 20 or so hunter-gatherers can endorse a norm whereby, as a reward or show of communal gratitude, the person who kills a deer to feed the collective gets the first steak during the evening feast. If ever a person who didn't kill the deer attempts to dive in and grab his steak before the person who killed the deer has had his steak, he would be met with censure, whereby the offender is jeered at for his disrespect. They throw insults and apply social pressure to make him reconsider. Perhaps the offender realises he's made a mistake and, in valuing the opinions of his friends, he puts down the stake and makes way for the hunter. In a different universe, where the guy doesn't care what his friends think of him, they may have to forcibly intervene if they think this norm is important enough to enforce a violence. Perhaps the initial censure and violent restraint was enough embarrassment to serve as an adequate cost for the stake grubber to make him think twice about doing it again. Or, perhaps this is not nearly the first time he has attempted to grab a stake before it was his turn. So the group decide that he must face further punishment, such as partaking in communal chores he wouldn't be expected to do normally, or they may choose a punishment more severe, which really could range all the way up to execution. In any of these cases, and whether we agree with some of these punishments more or less than others, we have what we may recognise as law functioning within our primitive society without a court, without a police force and without a central government. The point of this hypothetical was to try and detach us from the notion that these components of law enforcement are essential to the concept of law. Now, let's change the environment a little bit. Let's say a group of 20 office workers in Manhattan decide to order some pizzas between them every Friday. They decide that since not many of them are in the mood for a whole pizza to themselves, to order about 10 different pizzas. One of the employees, Alice, is vegan and her co-workers decide it's okay for her to have priority over a smaller vegan pizza since, as she cannot eat the others, it would be unfair for them to help themselves to her vegan pizza. One Friday, a non-vegan, Dave, decides to take a heap of slices from the vegan pizza without asking Alice. The rest of the employees see what he's doing and confront him about it. They say that the vegan pizza is for Alice because she can't eat anything else. Dave can choose to either put the slices back or to ignore their request. If he ignores their request, he may face some form of disciplinary action, which may escalate to the use of force, i.e. to forcibly remove him from the premises after being asked to leave. Now, is this law? The common answer will likely be no, even though that this scenario is analogous to the primitive commune apart from the fact that the office workers operate within a society which already has a universally recognised legal system which does not concern itself with the rules of intra-office pizza related additions. A popular response to this would be to say that law is determined by the highest authority, which covers a given area. But that would be incorrect. International law has been designed and enforced by international communities, whilst we still acknowledge that nation-states which abide by such international laws are arbitrators of law themselves. A similar demonstration of this would be the United States, where states are able to make what we recognise as laws whilst abiding by a higher federal law themselves. Another answer could be that the office workers operate within a wider community, and the law applies to that community. But this answer has several problems. What defines a community? Is Manhattan the community? What about New York City? What about New York State? What about the United States of America altogether? What about the entire planet? So, why doesn't this identification of law follow further down, all the way down to company policy and group traditions? OK, they operate beneath a higher authority, but so does New York State, as does Congress. So why do their rules get to be called laws, but company policies don't, even though they would be considered laws without those higher powers? I suppose it's something to do with the connotations the word law has with the state apparatus, which we demonstrated earlier was not inherently connected in our primitivist colony. My point here is that the standards for what many of us are willing to call law are not consistently applied. I see no reason to suggest that company policies or enforceable group traditions are not themselves laws. They meet the definition, at least. The history of anarchism and libertarianism is rich with historical examples of communities organising and respecting each other without the use of state force. The examples I will be discussing, in this order, will be Revolutionary Catalonia, Manova China, and modern-day Christiania. First, Catalonia. In perhaps the most widely celebrated historical anarchist experiment, the Catalan anarchists seized control of the streets of Barcelona in 1936. Since then, anarchists have put a lot of effort towards detailing the Catalan economy under the control of anarcho-syndicalist trade unions, 
but studies under the Catalan approach to law and order are few and far between. It's important to note here that Catalonia was a society at war, meaning the anarchists were continuously responding to an external existential threat, that being Franco's nationalists. This meant that the transition from liberal to anarchist social order was not at all a peaceful one. Civil unrest in the streets, vandalism against public and religious buildings, and forcible expropriation of private property meant that the anarchists had to deal with a persistent moral panic aimed at their movement by news outlets such as the conservative La Vanguardia, the liberal republican L'Opinio, and even the socialist Justia Social, and others from these political backgrounds. By running endless articles of the expropriation and violence which occurred within the Barcelona's revolution, the moral panics were designed to divide the Spanish working class along ethical lines. By presenting the CNT as a group of lawless, ungodly, thieving, free love promoting, fetus killing, alien welcoming, youth indoctrinating, unproductive dissidents to workers outside of Catalonia, they depended on the learned moral convictions of their readers to tarnish the reputation of the syndicalist experiment, even if the aims of the CNT was in line with the material interests of their readership. To help paint a picture of the moral panic in Spain against the Unionists, let me provide a comparison. The behaviour of the Spanish media in reaction to the Catalan Revolution is startlingly similar to that of the conservative media across the West in response to the Black Lives Matter protests. Rather than focusing on the aims of the movement, which were nothing all too controversial, reactionary pundits simply focused on the minority of incidents involving violence on part of the BLM supporters. This red herring became so influential it got to the point where, here, even here in the UK, the suggestion that you support BLM was taken as an admission of guilt to being pro-violence and looting. Obviously, there's this analogy between these two sagas. The BLM protests never amounted to anything like a civil war, and the CNT was actively engaged in war. But there is still a similarity between the response of BLM and the CNT to the moral panics directed against them respectively. A significant portion of BLM supporters decided to distance the actions of looters and rioters from the wider BLM movement. They argued that while the actions of the few are immoral, the majority of protesters were peaceful and only wanted to see an end to police brutality, and that some had been driven to violence as a result of how severe the problem is to them. However, a smaller, more radical section made the argument that even the more violent qualities of the protests were justified, as they were protesting not just police brutality, but also the establishment as a whole. Capitalist businesses were set to have their assets seized as acts of rebellion against an oppressive class, which is intertwined with a white supremacist social order. What this section of BLM supporters were doing is providing a counter-morality against that which was condemning their direct action. Linking back to topic, the latter more radical response to the moral panics was that which was adopted by the CNT in response to the moral panics levied against their own movements by the Spanish press. They blamed criminality on the Spanish bourgeois, who, through siphoning off the wealth generated by the workers, had impoverished the Catalan population and drove many of them into desperation. Many in the CNT proudly welcomed the concept of free love, legal abortions and solidarity with foreign workers. The CNT promoted a counterculture to help shield its movement from moral panic. If the workers of Barcelona were not in cultural harmony with that of the progressives in the FAI, then the FAI leaders would have been handed over to the reactionaries by the city. The generation of new social norms became an essential component of revolutionary praxis. A way of doing this was to promote the illegality of workers as a liberating means of wealth redistribution. The groundworks for a new social order being driven by via revolutionary CNT propaganda, which revolved around the syndicalist understanding of working class emancipation, was set in place. This ideology, rooted in working class struggle, would become the basis for the resultant social norms which were eventually facilitated and reinforced by trade unions across Barcelona. Following the success of the military uprising in Barcelona, which granted anarchist control of the city, the streets were riddled with a network of barricades, which had been used by the anarchists in the fighting as defensive structures. The barricades, which were not obstructing the circulation of vehicles, were left to stand as a symbol of the workers' triumph. Though, as well as symbolism, the remaining barricades also served as the boundaries for a network of revolutionary committees which facilitated local decision-making and producing what we would call law, and they federalised with each other as consequence. However, there were problems. There were still a considerable number of people in the city who were not anarchists. The CNT had to make a choice between collaborating with the non-anarchist anti-fascist groups or imposing a so-called anarchist dictatorship upon them. Clearly, 
they were wanting to avoid the paradoxical dilemmas of an anarchist dictatorship, and so the CNT decided to collaborate. And consequently, the Central Committee of Anti-Fascist Militias was established and was cited as the real government of Catalonia, although, as the name suggests, this body primarily dealt with managing the war effort. The CCAM did exist alongside the Generalitat, the Republican governing body of Catalonia. However, the Generalitat's influence was near negligible. Any notion of governance was exercised on the streets, through local committees, defensive committees, and popular militias. Even orders from the CCAM were often ignored. Only those actively engaged in the war effort outside the city had any reason to listen to them. Different aspects of Barcelona's political economy were managed by completely separate federations and unions, which often had very little to do with one another, despite Republican attempts to re-establish liberal control over the city. Production was thus managed and regulated by trade unions, many of which were confederated into the CNT. Polycentricity of law and order had emerged, and the, given the ongoing tensions in the city, it seemed to be a far more workable alternative to a monopolised consolidation of power. I will talk more about polycentricity later on. Ukraine A lesser known anarchist experiment was the Free Territory of Ukraine from 1918 to 1921. Following on from the fallout of the Russian and Ukrainian revolutions, the anarchist insurrectionary militia, commonly known as the Black Army, fought against reactionary forces from multiple nations, including compatriot nationalist groups and Russian communists, to establish and preserve a revolutionary anarchistic society in East Ukraine, which was resided by 7 million people. Like in Catalonia, the anarchists of Ukraine were attempting to establish a free society amongst the turmoil of civil war and reactionary invasion which had certainly impeded their attempts to put their anarchist ideals into practice. After being betrayed by Moscow, when Magnavite headquarters staff were executed on the spot after arriving at what they believed to be a planning conference, the Black Army was eventually defeated by Bolshevik forces in 1921. During this time, what would have been excellent sources on the history of the events such as Magnavite's memoirs and printings from local newspapers were lost. Before going further, it's important to note that, unlike the Catalan Revolution led by industrial trade unions, the anarchism of Ukraine emerged from the agricultural background of insurrectionary peasant associations. This is a point which will become relevant further down the line. After release from prison, Makhno organised and led the Peasants' Union in Golye Polye and was elected as peasant's representative in local government. The first of what may be recognised as anarchist policy was actually enacted through the local government. Matno's anarcho-communist platform was popular among peasants at the time, who shared his disdain for the Tsarist ruling classes, and this support allowed Matno to expropriate land owned by the aristocracy in favour of peasant ownership. In fact, the boost in peasant morale as a result of owning the land on which they toiled has been credited as a contributing factor towards the greater crop yields observed during these land reforms. Matno consequently gains a Robin Hood type image, and thus the foundations for anarchist living were already being laid. The militarism of the Matnovist movement was actually not thanks to Nestor Matno himself. The origins of the Black Army can instead be traced back to the Black Guards established by Maria Marussia Nikivarova, a contemporary but by far more radical anarchist. Unlike Matno, with his preference for peaceful reform and popular support, Marussia was actively engaged in terror attacks against the Ukrainian elite and inspired Black Guard regiments to successfully strike Priobrzensky regiment in Orekov, much to Matno's disapproval. Marusi's engagement in violent class conflict has been credited with, with energising radical and revolutionary spirit amongst the Ukrainian peasantry and has thus provided a clear basis for the militaristic wing of Makhno's peasant movement. The overall insurrectionary nature of the Maknovite movement could even be owed to Marusi's Alexandrovsk Anarchist Project Federation, since it even went as far as accusing Makhno's peasant union of attempting to establish a political party to, to seize power in the local Soviet. Following the October Revolution and Russian withdrawal from World War I, large swathes of Ukrainian territory were ceded to German and Austro-Hungarian occupation. Long story short, this pushed the Ukrainian peasantry over the edge and thus made joining the Maknovite movement an attractive option for many peasants. To secure their gains in and around Golie Polie, the Black Army was finally established as the militia of Makhno. As well as defence from external forces, this militia was also used to provide the security of citizens against wrongdoers in Ukraine, thus making them enforcers of what I would call the laws of the free territory of Ukraine. 
Anarchist ideals were implemented with few concessions in the Black Army. Whilst there was no historical debate on whether personnel consisted of only volunteers or the inclusion of conscripts from liberated territories, despite allegations of conscription by anarchist critics, we know that the Maknavites distributed pamphlets pleading for volunteer soldiers, and Trotsky conceded that the militia was unlikely to even be capable of conscripting personnel. Further, regimental officers were elected by soldiers from their own ranks, however, general staff were appointed by Makhno. Whether you think this is in line with anarchist ideals, I'll let you decide. There did exist a counterintelligence force under the command of Makhno, which was tasked with falling enemy espionage and assassination attempts against Makhno himself and other generals. The Kontraveska was responsible for logistics within the Makhnovist movement and was actively engaged in requisitioning supplies for the militia from citizenry, although not an unusual component of insurrectionary armies in the area at the time, these activities were perhaps the least compatible with the Maknovist China's anarchist ideals, and Makhno publicly announced his regret for the excessive activities of this counterintelligence service amongst Ukrainian citizenry. As far as law was concerned in the Free Territory, following the February Revolution in 1917, anarchists in the urban parts of Ukraine began to organise into small, local, democratic and voluntary federations. Prior to becoming the main social unit of organisation, these federations, which are peasants often called committees of public organisations or committees of public safety, were initially tasked with deciding the political aims of the participating workers, as well as organising mutual aid and other acts which they deemed were necessary contributions to the revolution. The power of organised revolutionary peasants and workers eventually accumulated to the point where, either at the orders of the public committees or, their own on, or on their own initiative, Tsarist officials were arrested, government buildings were occupied and police were disarmed. These committees continued to develop as peasants and workers became more confident in their ability to run their own farms and workplaces without external guidance, which resulted in the ideological conflict with the Bolsheviks and their supporters who placed a, a strong emphasis of centralisation. Most of what we could call law by our earlier definition focused on land reforms similar to that of what Makhno had campaigned for in local governments, which ensured worker and peasant autonomy. It is important to be aware here that these anarchist federations developed independently of each other within the same areas and maintained, for the most part, cooperative relationships with each other. The plurality of federations allowed for workers and peasants to organise according to their own needs and conditions. The peasants did not meddle in the affairs of what went on in factories, and workers did not enforce a dictatorship of the proletariat over the peasants. Some of these federations were communistic and emphasised a need to organise when tune with the wider community, and others were mutualistic and focused on bringing products to local markets. Again, the word polycentric becomes relevant. When the Black Army liberated a town, they were noted not to have pillaged or conscripted from the area. Discipline under Makhno's command was strict and often terminal, and this gave Makhno the platform to deliver his anarchist message to the workers of a local area. As Paul Averick notes, his first act on entering a town after throwing open the prisons was to dispel any impression that he had come to introduce a new form of political rule. Announcing to the inhabitants that they are now free to organise their lives as they saw fit, that his insurgent army would not dictate to them or order them to do anything. Free speech, press and assembly were proclaimed, however Makhno would not countenance organisations which sought to impose political authority, and he accordingly dissolved the Bolshevik revolutionary committees, instructing their members to take up some honest trade. In fact, when the Black Army secured a town or village, they often left a poster reading, Workers, your city is for the present occupied by the revolutionary insurrectionary army. This army does not serve any political party, any power, any dictatorship. On the contrary, it seeks to free the region of all political power, of all dictatorship. It strives to protect the freedom of action, the free life of workers, against all exploitation and domination. The Maknavist army does not, therefore, represent any authority. It will not subjugate anyone to any obligation whatsoever. Its role is confined to defending the freedom of workers. The freedom of the peasants and the workers belong to themselves and should not suffer any restriction. The shortcomings of the Maknavites was clearly most evident in urban areas where the residents had not yet taken up anarchist ideals for themselves. Although relatively impressive in terms of military strategy, the Maknavites lacked the intellectual influence to help implement their ideas in settings they were not familiar with for people who were not familiar with them. The decision to mandate the acceptance of all currency, which came directly from the Black Army, was disastrous and led to confusion and inflation. 
For peasants, inflation had very little impact on their livelihoods when they could grow and live off their own food supplies. But for the proletariat, this means being able to buy less food and clothing imported to the cities. The theoretical incoherency, and genuine incoherency, of the Maknavites has been attributed to their much-needed focus on the military defence of a territory and the, quote, purest cowardice of Russian anarchists who refused to aid the cultural education wing of the movement to entrench anarchism amongst southern Ukraine. Krishtania. Moving into the modern day, Krishtania exists as a small anarchist district in Copenhagen, Denmark, one which I've had the pleasure of visiting in the summer of 2019. I say the community is small, it consists of roughly 1,000 residents and covers a mere 19 acres. I decided to include Christiania here simply because I predict that the establishment of micro-societies such as these within urban areas will function as a step in the direction of establishing an anarchist mega-society. The first anarchist societies, I think, will develop from these intentional communities which exist within capitalist civilization. But that's a topic for another video. Freetown Christiania was established in 1971 as a result of a housing shortage in the Danish capital when homeless people broke down the fences to a derelict military base to find shelter and play areas for their children in the unused buildings. The Danish government ordered the squatters to vacate the area, but the refusal of the residents led to, after an 18-year struggle, to the Danish authorities granting the right of settlement to the Christianians in 1989. Despite the residents of Freetown Christiania declaring themselves independent from the Danish state, the state still recognises the area as being under its own jurisdiction. According to the government, cannabis is still illegal in Christiania, despite Christianian rules, or as I call it law, stating otherwise and cannabis sales occurring freely in the area. Speaking of such, Christiania does indeed have its own common law, and they are displayed across the town. Rules against violence, hard drugs and even private car ownership are decided by a participatory democracy at what are called community meetings, where any resident is welcome to attend and discuss issues which affect the whole community of Christiania. Specific aspects of the Christianian society are discussed at specialised conferences such as economy meetings or area meetings. This localised participatory democracy is a means of removing the distinction between citizen and governor, establishing a socialised form of anarchism. Christiania, like all anarchist experiments, have by no means perfected the anarchist ideology. However, that may never happen since humans themselves have no good track record for perfection. Clashes with Copenhagen authorities and police crackdowns has rendered the zone merely a partially autonomous community, with laws against most drugs and mandatory taxation being imposed externally as a means of keeping the town from complete forcible reabsorption back into capitalist hegemony. The fulfilment of their complete sovereignty is yet to be realised. However, I think Christiania still provides an interesting example of horizontal governance functioning in urban communities. There are, of course, many other examples of anarchist societies existing throughout history and in the modern day. These three societies were chosen as they were the ones I was most familiar with when coming to write the script for this video. A discussion of other examples is a possible area for future work on my behalf. But now is the time for discussion on the theory of polycentric legal order itself. The examples I have just described are examples of social anarchism in practice, influenced by theories such as Proudhon, Bakunin and Kropotkin. This takes the shape of horizontalization, whereby the distinction between governor and owner is either minimized or annihilated altogether. However, there is another model based on removing the monopoly in force in society, which is unofficially in existence in Catalonia and the Ukraine. In the book Anarchy and Legal Order, Gary Chartier lays the groundworks for what he describes as a polycentric legal order. Following an ethical analysis of law and a critique of the state as monopoly in law, Chartier explains how a variety of consent-based legal regimes could be employed to maintain social order in a stateless society. Unlike the state, which is by definition both aggressive and monopolistic, these legal regimes rely on voluntary participation. They would display a diversity in structure, and Chartier describes three potential models of legal regime. The first is a territorially localised consensus-based regime, which is made up of the majority but not all people in a given geographic area, which would function similarly to the social anarchist models, but it doesn't assume that living local to the regime's headquarters means a person has consented to their legal code. 
these people would be the members of other legal regimes. The second model is a non-territorial agreement-based regime which functions more like a consumer cooperative. And the third is a non-territorial communal legal entity which serves people who are part of a particular religious or cultural community. Chartier explains the legal rules enforced by the many different legal regimes operating within a given area will be diverse but not random. There is what Chartier calls an inherent appeal for particular laws, such as the protection against murder, and there are practical advantages for people living in, within an area for their legal regimes to have common ground on baseline rules. There is economic pressures against absurd or meddlesome rules, for example granting people the right not to be looked at in public, since the costs of enforcing these rules are internalised. Solving disputes between parties within the same legal regime is easy. Both parties have agreed to the legal code and methods of law enforcement of that particular legal regime, and so the dispute is resolved accordingly. If a dispute occurs between members of two different legal regimes, then both regimes in question would be interested in establishing guidelines, be they choice of law, conflict of law, terms of third party arbitration, etc., which each member consents to as per being part of the respective legal regimes. The advantages of the polycentric legal order include the ability to exit legal regimes which enforce laws the member in question finds unjust. When the state holds a monopoly in law and its laws are oppressive, as is often the case, the only get-out option available to the citizen is emigration. Polycentricity allows for individuals to consider for themselves the kind of legal codes and enforcement policies which are suited for their needs. Potential problems could occur from confusion about who is abiding by which legal code, However, the existence of such confusion will apply pressure to legal regimes to compromise with each other and have substantially similar baseline rules. The final point I'll make here is that the nature of polycentricity anchors the legal codes provided by legal regimes to a libertarian framework. The laws provided by legal regimes must appeal to the people who they expect to follow them, and so invasive and paternalistic laws are less likely to appear on the list of laws provided by a legal regime which leads me to a discussion of what kinds of laws may be observed in an anarchist society. It will need to be recognised by anarchists that future stateless societies, if ever they even come to pass, will likely exhibit a variety of legal rules being enforced by a variety of legal regimes. The types of laws in place will greatly depend on the material conditions of the geographical area and the ideological nature of the anarchist movement which had established with the free society in the first place. Baseline rules against murder, aggressions against the body and theft of personal possessions will of course be present. However, the finer details of property rights, environmental regulations, management of communal property will need to be defined even if there exists no obvious and clear ethical answers about how to do so. In Christiania, for example, Private car ownership is not recognised by the locals, however, in Puerto Real and Cadiz, it is. The standout laws of anarchist societies are often determined by the specific flavour of anarchism which precedes them. For example, militant anarcho-syndicalist laws concern the organisation of the working class and the collectivisation of capital, whereas the squatters' movements in Christiania and Exarchia in Athens are more focused on providing a haven for members of the lumpen proletariat, often with an emphasis on the drug trade or refugees. This is an expected product of self-governance, as the identity of the people within the area are strongly reflected in the management of their local areas. Polycentric legal orders will revolve around individualised laws, i.e. protections of the individual against external forces, as well as regulations on the disputes occurring within and across legal regimes. The ability for people to exit legal regimes would render victimless crimes as an absurdity, unless people are actually willing to be punished externally for doing something to themselves. All in all, the laws which are present in anarchist societies are often restricted to defending baseline rights, such as life and autonomy, whilst management of industries becomes a responsibility of people who work at said industries. In conclusion, I argue that law and order should not be regarded as an essentially status concept. Anarchists are not opposed to organisation or to security, as these two are key aspects of a stable and safe living space, and thus it makes sense for anarchists to engage in organised security, which itself requires a fresh understanding of law as a concept of independent from modern state machinery. <laughs>
We have seen how prefiguration and counter morality have contributed to the legal positions of anarchist movements, be they strategic, social, or economic policies, in response to the material conditions and the reactionary narratives they were set up against. Where freedom of association has been applied in larger areas with more expansive populations, such as Catalonia and Ukraine, a polycentric network of proto legal regimes have been established. In Catalonia, this took the shape of a community led by trade unions with varying relationships with one another, and the agrarian communities of Ukraine were organised via peasant associations and federations. I believe that, having served their revolutionary functions and not abandoning their respect for free association, those unions, federations and associations would have gradually become the primary regulatory bodies and thus become recognisable to Chartier's description of deterritorialised legal regimes. In smaller communities, the polycentric approach loses out to the concept of horizontalization and direct democracy as a means of removing the monopoly enforced from the state and removing the distinction between governor and citizen. This may be due to the close-knit nature of these neighbourhoods, where most people know each other and thus have little desire for alternative means of organising. The laws produced by anarchist associations are diverse, yet often correspond to the material conditions of the anarchists within them. These laws primarily concern themselves with protecting baseline individual liberties, with some exceptions, like the car ban in Christiania and the mandate on currency in Ukraine. Whilst it is certainly interesting and important to speculate and ponder about what anarchist law might look like, we're clearly still nowhere near the stage where we can even think of realising it. We in the UK are still in the embryonic stage of spreading class and state consciousness and trying to wrestle our way to the front of anti-establishment politics in order for anarchist federations to even have members to federalise with. As mentioned and demonstrated earlier, prefiguration, counterculture and counter-economics must precede the shift towards anarchism. And that is the final point on which I will leave you. I do have plans for future videos on stateless law, and I'm also planning responses to Marx's critiques of Stirner and Proudhon, and I will finally bring myself to the Vorge question. Another idea I thought about was producing an audio recording of Stirner's critics by Max Stirner. For now though, I hope you found this video as intriguing as I found the reading that went behind it. If you did, give it a like and leave a comment. You can find all my sources in the description for further reading. And, on that note, I'll see you later. Ta-ta.